Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Pori Ranch stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! First one is titled, Retail Manager Gets Revenge. Customer loses $3,500 in 45 minutes. My local drugstore is having a gift card promotion. They're offering gift cards for a major chain hardware store at 10% off face value. They let you pay by credit card and get cash back, and you get reward points at the hardware store. Not only that, it's nearly Black Friday. I wanted to buy some semi-expensive tools, and I figured I'd stack as many discounts as I could. So I went to the drugstore and asked for $1,500 in gift cards. A very friendly assistant manager showed up near instantly to triple check my ID and casually mention how gift card scams work. Rewind a year. I read an article in our newspaper about this unfortunate person who lost $3,500 to the CRA, IRS if you're American, scam. I'm sure you've heard of it. Someone with an accent calls you, tells you owe an exorbitant amount for your income taxes, tells you to buy iTunes gift cards, scratch off the security strip, and read them the numbers. If you refuse, they threaten you with arrest. It's an obvious scam to anyone with half a brain. At the time, I wondered just how a store could not know about this scam, and why they would in good conscience sell thousands of dollars in iTunes gift cards and not find it suspicious. Now I know. This assistant manager says, last year, this customer comes in and asks for $2,500 in iTunes cards. I knew right away it was a scam and started to explain how the scam worked. This individual wasn't having it. She became belligerent. She started swearing at us and threatening us. So this poor assistant manager, who probably had a career full of bending over for angry customers who have learned they can get discounts and free stuff if they are dicks, decides to get revenge. And here's where the malicious compliance comes in. The assistant manager sells the $2,500 worth of iTunes gift cards. 45 minutes later the customer is back with the cops. They had left and bought an additional $2,500 at another store. The scammer then told them it still wasn't enough and to go to a third store. At that point, the victim realized there was an itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow possibility this may be a scam. The cops called Apple. $3,500 of the gift cards had already been used. They voided the remaining $1,500 and the customer was refunded after a time. I hate some of my customers, but I like to think I would not go as far as helping them get scammed out of thousands of dollars. But today, I met someone jaded enough to do just that. Next one is titled, Block My Driveway? Have fun with my dog's poop. We live near a tourist spot and parking can get a little dicey in the weekend. Luckily, we have a driveway and one car so it's not an issue. Saturday, my husband had to pick me up from work. When we returned, we found our driveway was blocked by another car. We're pretty close to our neighbors and it wasn't one of their cars, so we were at a loss on whose it was. We were annoyed but not terribly inconvenienced since there was parking in front of our house. So we call the city. Turns out, if you're not blocked in your driveway, then they won't tow. Parking enforcement deals with those issues and they don't work on weekends. I love pranks so I took matters into my own hands. It's time to pick up the dog poop and I tie each of the bags to the door handles. Double knotted so you can't just pull off the bags. I don't have enough poop so I had to get some from my neighbor's house, I'm dedicated. We open the windows and quietly go about our business. The driver returns with their friend four hours later. The poop bags have been hanging in the sun, it smells rank. We hear the driver absolutely appalled at the bags. Then they try to rationalize blocking our driveway. They checked, it didn't seem like a big deal you know, nothing that excuses blocking a driveway. The driver looks to their friend who then says, that seems fair. Friend took the bags and the driver went on their way. That driver will think twice next time they come visit. Next one is titled, Retail Revenge on Corrupt Coworkers and Managers. 
Years ago I worked at a plus-sized women's clothing store in a bad part of town. The store was part of a national chain and its clothing was designed for the younger crowd. Our store was not part of a mall but was part of a strip mall that sat right up against some low-income housing. I really enjoyed working there because I got to help people shop. I also enjoyed helping plus-sized girls feel beautiful. My pay was barely above minimum wage but my husband works in IT and he makes enough money to keep us comfortable. There were a few things I didn't like about my company. For one, they made us sell magazine subscriptions at the register that were basically a scam. It's 25 cents a year now but you'll be charged an inflated rate next year for a renewal. I felt bad because I knew many of my customers were low income and probably wouldn't remember to cancel. The other thing we were required to do is aggressively push our store credit card. I wasn't good at pushing the magazines or the credit cards and it was no secret that our regional manager was not pleased with my performance. Despite having amazing sales numbers, because my magazine and credit applications were low I was treated poorly by my store manager, Gina, and the regional manager, Rick. Out of all of the associates, I was the only one that had trouble getting magazine subscribers and credit applicants. I later discovered that one of the associates had a boyfriend that was also a drug dealer. He would give his drug customers a discount in exchange for their personal information and social security numbers so his girlfriend could run their info on credit applications. This associate was best friends with our store manager, Gina. This girl shared all of this information with all of the associates except for me. I later heard that I was resented because I was a rich white witch. Another crappy part of working at this store was dealing with shoplifters. Even though the city's police station was across the street from our store, people would come in and try to pull a fast one on us. If we knew someone was shoplifting, one of the associates would start a conversation with a shoplifter while the other associate went in the back room to call the police. Our store had no anti-theft systems and it had no security cameras. Because our amount of shrink was so high, our store was put on probation and we regularly had a company come in and take inventory of our merchandise. We knew how much our store was losing every three months. Corporate sent down some head honchos from loss prevention that would interview us one at a time and try to figure out if one of the staff was stealing. The man they sent was named Jack. Jack gave me his name and cell number and told me I could call him if I noticed or suspected any of my co-workers was stealing. On one of the days that our merchandise was going to be inventoried the regional manager, Rick, arrived. This was odd because Rick lived in the neighboring state somewhere. He must have left his home at 4 a.m. to be there when we opened. Rick spent the day manipulating the inventory results. He would do things like make the people taking inventory scan empty shoeboxes and inventory shirts twice. I went home and wrote down everything that I remembered. On July 3rd I received a text from Gina. She wanted to know if I had set aside a particular shirt to purchase for myself. She sent a picture of the shirt. I told her it was not mine. The following day I noticed Gina had posted pictures of herself at a July 4th barbecue wearing the shirt. When I got to work the following day, I checked the inventory. No associates made any purchases at all that week. That shirt was never sold, in any size, at our store but one was missing from the racks. Gina had stolen it. I went home and I created a PowerPoint presentation with screenshots of my text messages with Gina about the shirt, details from our inventory, and pictures from Gina's Facebook page showing she had the shirt. I also provided the details of the credit card application scams my coworkers were running. I sent this off to Jack, the loss prevention guy at corporate, and waited. Within an hour my phone lit up. Jack told me I would be transferred to any store I chose for coming forward and I was rewarded with a $100 gift card. He told me they knew about the credit card applications being fake because the same 20 people were applying over and over again. I knew that no matter what store I chose, Rick would still be my boss, so I told Jack I would think about it. When I got to work the following day, Rick and Jack were there. Gina and her best friend were fired and were already gone. Within one ducking week, I was being written up for not having enough credit apps. I quit right then and there.
I went home and called Jack and told him about Rick's inventory manipulations. I gave a tip about our magazine program to a major consumer publication and they published stuff about it on their website. This chain used to have 20 locations in our state. Now it has two. I just looked on LinkedIn and Rick still works for the company. Oh, well, I feel like I got revenge. Next one is titled, a small protest against a bad business can bring an entire town together. A shitty repair shop in Moab, UT messed up our car which left us stranded in a nearby national park. We called and demanded they tow the vehicle in, and while they said they'd come to get us they never did. When we talked with park rangers they were quite familiar with the shop, the biggest in town, and with a terrible reputation. We were on our honeymoon and had more time on our hands than I imagine most travelers do. We went to the shop, demanded a full refund, and when they refused we sat out front on the curb in our camp chairs for two days with homemade protest signs. I was overwhelmed with the support we got from locals, who honked and waved, stopped and chatted with us, and shared their own stories of horror. The owner called the cops on us, but the joke was on him. We'd already notified the police we'd be protesting and were well within our rights in doing so. In the end, the shop owner refunded all our money and left visibly distressed when we told him that even with the refund, we weren't sure we were ready to leave town. Eventually, we did, but not before filing complaints with the Better Business Bureau and every review site we could find. They'd already been booted from the Chamber of Commerce. We ended up becoming friends with an awesome local mechanic, and having a great story to tell. Justice was served, and without a tinge of guilt. Next one is titled, Actually Got Revenge on a Spectacularly Messy Customer. A girl came in and tried on a bunch of clothes, and after she left, without purchasing anything, the change room and immediate area looked like a bomb had gone off with clothing and hangers strewn everywhere. Clothes balled up and stuffed under the seat, thrown over adjoining clothing racks, just a huge mess. It was actually shocking, it took two of us quite while to clean and sort everything. I mean, we get some messy people, but this was a something else. It definitely made an impression. A few days later she came in with a resume, looking to get a job at our store. My boss, and luckily, my best friend of 20 years who does not suffer fools gladly, smirked as he called me over to tell me this young woman wanted a job. I looked at her in shock and said, I would never hire someone who makes such a huge mess while trying on clothes. Do you know how long it took us to clean up after you last time? She was taken aback and said, uh, oh, I'm not usually like that, I was in a hurry. I replied, we're often in a hurry here, it doesn't mean we make more work for other people. We don't need messy people with poor time management skills, thanks for your interest. I then handed her back her resume and she left, embarrassed. It may sound harsh, but I like to think that I taught her a valuable lesson that day, and hopefully from then on she was respectful of retail workers and merchandise, because brand new clothing that you don't want but that the store still has to try to sell to other customers doesn't belong on the floor or crumpled into balls. I'd also like to add that she was in the store trying on clothes for 30 plus minutes the first time, so if she was in a hurry it sure didn't show. Next one is titled, Dare to cut through traffic? Get ready to be drenched. I was living in a Middle Eastern country a few years back. Nice place, but because 50% of the population in the region is under the age of 20, the roads are simply overrun by teenagers and early 20s jerks. The culture's fatalism makes young guys even more reckless and irresponsible than they are already programmed to be by their hormones. So, after a rare rain shower, the highway is flooded up ahead. 18 inches deep. Traffic is backed up for at least a mile, and it takes us 15 minutes to get to the flooded patch. Everyone is pissed. Then I see two cars full of teenage jerks passing people on the shoulder on the right from way behind me. Mother ducker, there's just no excuse for that horse shit. Eventually, they get to where I am, and they pass me just as we're reaching the 50-yard stretch where the flooding is crossing the road. And wouldn't you know it? One of them crosses into the far left lane, and one stays in the right lane to avoid the deep water in the middle lane. And wouldn't you know it? Their windows are rolled down. 
I'm in a Toyota Land Cruiser, a nice big 4WD. So while they're crawling through a foot of water in their little action boy Hondas, I decide duck it and gun it between them through the deep stuff in the middle lane. The wave from my front wheels was about 6 feet high, and it had to have put 20 gallons of water through the windows of both cars. Completely ducking drenched, all of them, with nasty urban stormwater runoff. Of course, they chased up after me once they cleared the water, screaming and cursing, but I just pretended to be on my phone and ignored them. Eventually, they gave up and, I hope, figured I had just been as impatient and selfish as them and had hosed them by accident. Most satisfying revenge of my life. Next one is titled, Disturb the Peace? I'll shut you out of your place. Years ago, living in an apartment in Johannesburg, the block consisted mostly of elderly folk and a few young working couples like me and my wife, who generally hit the sack early. The place was like a morgue after 10 p.m., until a couple of guys move into the place below us. Party types, who would whoop it up till dawn. If anyone complained, they'd quickly get threatening. The owner of the apartment was one of the guy's dads, so they had no fear of being kicked out. One evening, around midnight, they hooked up with some friends and girls to go clubbing. They were outside in the road, talking, yelling, girls screeching. Eventually, they depart. I was furious, but being an original 90-pound wimp, felt helpless. Then I remembered the tube of superglue in my desk drawer. I went to their flat, which had a serious security gate protecting the front door. I put the glue nozzle into the gate lock, a heavy-duty bolt lock, and squeezed the sucker dry. A couple of hours later, lying in bed, I hear the party hardies arrive back. It's the same deal as when they left making a hell of a commotion as they spill out of their cars and head for the apartment. Then silence. Later I heard they ended up breaking the bathroom window and getting in that way. The girls of course were having none of it so they buggered off, as did the friends. The next day they had to get in a locksmith who used a blowtorch to cut the lockout out of its steel casing. This damaged the door behind, so both gate and door had to be replaced, along with the bathroom window. Because these boneheads did not have the money for all this, the dad who owned the apartment had to cough up the cash. He was so pissed off that he kicked out the roommate. From then on, it was the quietest flat in the building. Last one is titled, Won't give me your number? I'll throw away your phone. So my grandfather was driving and an obviously drunk man threw a rock and shattered his windshield. My grandfather talked to him and told him, if you give me your real number, I'll only have you pay for half of the windshield or we can figure something out. The guy turned out to give him a fake number. A year later, my grandfather picks up a guy from park and ride, carpooling, who happens to be the man that shattered his windshield. They're driving on the freeway and the guy doesn't recognize him. He's being rude and talking on his phone. My grandpa asks to see his phone and throws it out the window. The guy freaks out and my grandpa goes, remember me? He then made him get out of the car. Thanks for listening.